as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. It's a new day here, church. There's been a shift. There's been a releasing. There's been a new authority released upon our elders. There's been a new vision that's begun unfolding. And today, this series is not just a series. This is a, a time that speaks of what's happening globally. Not only in our church, not only in our community, but in the world. And we're going to the throne room in the scriptures, but we're also seeing the throne room is becoming reality for Christians across the world. But it's not something we look back on or look forward to, we're in it. So would you please stand for the reading of God's word? We'll be in Revelation chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, your devices, I encourage you to go there. Revelation chapter 4. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever, and ever the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Sounds like an amazing scene, an amazing place, hard to fathom, but it's not been unseen. We can go back to King David, we can go back and see that God gave a prophetic vision for the throne room that we just read about in Revelation, it's hot in here, will you come get this sir, thank you. King David already saw the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
as we can go back to 1 Chronicles in chapters 15 and 16, and we can see that, that as soon as David took the throne, as King David took the throne, the first thing he did was he brought back the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And the Ark of the Covenant he placed in the tent. And the Ark of the Covenant, if you'll remember, had a lid with cherubim on top. And that was the mercy seat of God. This was the throne of God. The forerunner of the throne that we're reading about in Revelation chapter 4 was present in 1 Chronicles 16. And yet that was a, 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 a lid of mercy with the law within the Ark of the Covenant inside. And a sacrifice would have to be made for us to be free of the law. And so on that mercy seat, once a year, people could, could come into that Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant used to be, separated from man with only the high priest able to access and, and make a sacrifice once a year for the atonement of the people. But David, but David saw what was to come. David saw who was to come. And he brought the Ark of the Covenant into a tent. And he, he began to say to his worshipers, to the Levites, we're, we're going to worship 24-7. My government will be centered around the presence of God and the worship and praise of his people. And so you see, the sacrifice of praise was offered in front of the Ark of the Covenant. No blood. And, and those that were surrounding the Ark of the Covenant, they didn't die because a sacrifice of praise was being given. 24-7. And Asaph, the leader, which means gatherer, Asaph, he gathered his worshipers together. They amounted to nearly 4,000 that were hired to, to pray and praise and worship 24-7 around this throne, the Ark of the Covenant. And there were 24 divisions of families within the Levites, if you will. Does this sound familiar? Did we not just read about 24 elders? Did we not just read about a throne in heaven? Did we not just read about continuous praise and worship around the throne of God. And it's, it's because of the sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus, the one who was and is and always will be. David saw it. That was a foretaste, a forerunner of what we'll experience one day. But I believe we're supposed to continue to experience now. We're in between David and Jesus' return. We're in between. We're not supposed to shut it down. We're supposed to propel it and continue it and prepare for his return. You see, the, the atmosphere of, of those that are in Christ, it's, it's changing. Church is changing. Church is becoming throne rooms. If they see what's happening in the times. That's my heart for our church gatherings. Is we, are to, we are to enter into his presence. Just as David placed the Ark of the Covenant where his, his presence was. God said to Moses, come here and meet with me here. And now Jesus has set us free from the law. And Jesus says... Come meet with me. I'm wherever you go. And even more special, where you gather. And so as we come Sunday after Sunday, we're coming into a throne room. It's here and now. It wasn't in David's time only, and it, wasn't, it isn't waiting for us, as we read in Revelation 4. We're in between. It's the kingdom has come, and it's coming. This is the, the, the magnitude of, of seeing the throne room, what it was, what it pictures, and what we will see in the future is, is the magnitude of the times right now for the church. 
You see, those creatures, those living creatures that we, it's so mysterious. We want to know more. What in the world? But those, those creatures, with, they're full of eyes and, and they're, they're all worshiping and, and looking towards the throne. They're pointing towards Jesus. They see Jesus. One, one creature is a lion. Royalty. One, one creature is, is a, what's the second one? An ox. A servant. An ox serves. A king that serves. A servant king. The, the third creature is a human. The humanity of Christ. The fourth creature is an, an eagle. The divinity of Christ. Fully man, fully human. Do you see these creatures? They're not so mysterious and scary. They're just pointing to Jesus, who he is. Royalty, servant, humanity, divine. Don't, don't shy away from the revelation of Jesus Christ given to John. It's not meant to be weird and strange and un, not understandable. But it is in the heavens, and it is a vision that John was taken up to in the Spirit. So him trying to describe is only how Holy Spirit led him to put it in the Scripture for us. Don't get too caught up in understanding every jot and tittle. There'll be more revelation, even here as we mature in Christ, but, but even there when we are present with him face to face. But do you see how, how amazing this scene is and how it, how it emulates what was happening in, in David's reign and rule? And Revelation is all about governance. It's all about the throne. It's all about the rule and reign of Christ. And, and now we see what's going on on the other side of the globe with, with Israel. And in Jerusalem particularly, where the throne of Jesus Christ will reside. Sounds like the rumblings. Sounds like the rattlings. I hear the sound. Do you hear the sound? Don't be caught off guard, believer. This is not a ho-hum, come to a religious meeting time of your life. This is a time where, like Lizzie, you, you should be getting tingles. I don't have much hair on my head to stand up, but it's standing up on my arms. Because the times are near for Jesus to return to his throne. It's exciting not to be fearful, but to be excited and, and, and be compelled to share the good news with those that don't know him. Prayer room this morning was awesome. It was a place of, of healing and anointing. And the elders came forward and, and laid hands on those that requested healing and anointed them with oil, as, as James says to do. There was salvation in the prayer room this morning as people surrender their lives to Jesus. It's a sign of the times. What's happening now? What will happen in the future? It's connected to what's happened in the past. There's some things in the throne room that I need to bring your attention to that I believe is, is for us, for this specific body, that you need to understand that in the throne room, as, as amazing as it sounds with peals of thunder and lightning and, and praises and thrones and, and creatures and angels, elders, and those four creatures, they're, they're a higher order of, they're like cherubim, they're angels. There's purpose, there's, there's order. As wild as it may sound, there is order in the throne room. Because there's governance coming from the throne room. You see, Jesus is ruling and reigning right now. He's seated on his throne. His work was finished on the cross. And so from that throne in heaven, a throne represents governance, comes order. And we need order. Order brings restraint. We need some restraint, godly restraint. It's for our own good. It's for our protection. The scriptures are full of restraints with freedom. Don't you love that? That we are so free, free of sin, free of, of religion, free of, of, 
of the things that the enemy puts in your head that doesn't define you. But there's order from the throne of governance. Proverbs 29, 18 says, When people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. You see, it's a, it's a good thing, church, for you to be engaged, connected, part of the church, the local church. And I'm so thankful as we come off of last week and I saw godly governance in action with our apostolic oversight helping us see some things that we saw but weren't sure about, but maybe seeing some things we didn't see and calling it out, both the good and the challenges. And then within the restraints of good and godly governance, move forward, be encouraged, take ground for the kingdom. Don't get sideways here, don't get sideways there. I love guardrails. I don't want to go off a cliff. I want to stay on the path that God has called you and me to and this church. Thank God for restraints. There was a, a time when there weren't as many restraints as you have today. It was called the 1980s. You know, every month you're going to hear an 80s stories from me. In the 80s. There were no seatbelt laws. North Carolina did not have seatbelt restraint laws until 1985. Oh, the freedom that we had. Where I could sit on the back dash of my dad's car. I could sleep on it. Well, you'll get a ticket today. There were less restraints then, but was that for the best? In, in the mid-late 80s, there was no protocol if you maybe got a concussion playing sports in high school. That didn't actually happen, I think, until 2011. The concussion protocols, if you're a sports fan and, and you see guys get hit hard on the football field and there's a protocol they have to follow if there's suspicion about them getting a concussion. They can't come right back out. Matter of fact, they, in, in high school, they have to uh, miss two games, I believe. Um, I can't remember the exact regulation, but North Carolina High School Association, Athletic Association, has put in a, a concussion protocol. Didn't have it when I played ball. And one of my vivid memories of, of playing ball in the Western Highlands Conference in the mountains these are mountains, but I mean, I'm talking about mountains where we don't have interstates and tourism. It's just us. It's just mountain people. And all we got to live for is sports, high school sports. There's no other distractions, no other diversions. There's not much economy either, sadly. So you're, we're blessed here to have some thriving economy. But back home, all there was to get together for was church and high school sports. And so a vivid memory of mine in this landscape of lesser restraints was a game between the high school rivalry of ours. Here it's Pisgah Tuscola. There it was Mitchell Mountain Heritage. Vicious rivalry in, in the high country. And, and although we had family, as we do here on both sides, when it came time for the game, there was a dividing line. And everybody got riled up. Well, I remember playing at Mountain Heritage, and their point guard was bound for Wake Forest University as their starting point guard. Their center was also bound for greatness in college as well. And if you know some mountain schools, we don't get a lot of, um, a big huge pool of talent because we're small, and we're not really tall. I don't see a lot of height here either. Doesn't include you, Jeff. But, so I say that to say, at 6'2", I was the center for my team. Because, why? We were all 6'2". So coach just picked somebody. Stanberry, you're center this year. 
So I'm up against this giant of a man for playing our rival high school. He's a, he's a future college star. In the first quarter of this game, I'm, I'm slipping past him sometimes to sneak in a layup or two. But then when I get the courage to take a jump shot, it, he's very intimidating. And it, it comes off, and he gets the rebound, and I'm caught right behind him. And when he gets the rebound, swings those what we used to call chicken wings. He swings his elbow and clocks me right in my nose. And I'm out, laying on the court, bleeding. I'm kind of like, not even, don't know where I am. Game stops, and they have to take me off the the court, they take me in the locker room, they're cleaning up the blood off the floor, and game starts back up, and I'm dying to get back out there, but I don't even know where I am. So in the locker room, they get the towels and the stuff to stop the bleeding, because you can't come back out and play when you're bleeding. So they're putting the towel on me, and it's full of blood, and they take me back out to the bench, and uh, as I said, we're all 6'2". <laughs> And we, we are fighting our, our rival team. So coach looks at me and says, you okay, Stanberry? Yeah, coach. Get back in there. So I get back in there, and my mom is so mad. It's like she's ready to come out of the stands. Like some of the other parents are having to hold her back. And she comes down to the bench where I was sitting, grabs my bloody towel, goes back up in the stands, and when I start playing, she's slinging that bloody towel. <laughs> Woo! She's coming after who hurt her boy whenever she gets a chance. I could just see the rage on her. She's swinging that bloody towel, standing up, and everybody's like, oh, mom. So after the game, we didn't win. After the game... <laughs> My mom makes a beeline for the visiting team's locker room. And she stands outside with that bloody towel waiting. Waiting for that player. And I asked her later, I said, Mom, what, what happened? What, were you, what was going on over there? She said, well, the coach kept coming out and looking outside the door. And every time he saw me, he shut the door and nobody would come out. Finally, two police had to come and get my mom... <laughs> And take her out of the gym. Never seen my mom like that. It doesn't end there. I don't ride the bus home. My parents take me home. It should have been a concussion protocol. I should have been checked out by a doctor. I think I still suffer from that today. I get home and, and find out that my little brother, middle school was at a friend's house watching horror movies, which greatly troubles him, makes him physically sick, but he gave in to the peer pressure of the, the sleepover that was happening. And he got so sick that the parents of where he was visiting brought him home. And so my little brother was waiting at home for us to come home from the ball game, scared from this horror movie, was in the house alone, felt like he needed a weapon, so he goes out to the garage and gets my grandpa's machete that he clears brush with. And he's sitting on the couch with the lamp on and the machete in his hand. <laughs> Where are my parents? Where is my brother? I wish they would get home. We come home. I open the door. I've got my bloody towel. And I come staggering in with a concussion with this blood all over me. And the light comes on. My brother turns around with a machete that's heavier than he is. And he's like, ah! And he can't even lift it because it's so heavy. And he's so tiny. If you ever met my brother, he's small. And he's freaking out because I come in with this bloody appearance. We have to calm him down. But all this could have been avoided with a concussion protocol. That would have sent me to where I needed to go. And I, I tell you that funny story because some of you are walking around like you got a, a bloody towel because of the restraints that are not present in your life. And you've let 
hurts and wounds and things come at you and you're not under the covering of godly men and women that can pray for you, speak life over you, and minister healing to you. So those wounds, those bloody scars, those things, whatever, that are not meant to be in your life will be removed. That's called order. That's called protocol. That's called governance in your life. Christian godly governance with checks and balances that keep horror stories like that from happening. We've all got them. We've all got spiritual horror stories. And we've got ministry for that. So there's no need to keep walking around with a bloody towel. In the throne room, there is order. In the throne room, there is governance. In the throne room, there is protection. We need to be in the throne room. Because all the eyes on those creatures could see so many things. When you're in the throne room, you're able to see so many things in the spirit that you can't see when you're walking around in the flesh and you're not going to the throne room in the spirit. God opens your eyes to see. That's why I'm hurting. That's why this is confusing. That's why this is occurring in my life. Otherwise, you're still carrying the towel. Don't you want to let go of that? Don't you want to see what's happening in the Spirit? Where there's order, there's healing. You, don't re- you often don't relate that. You think order means restriction. But where there's order and good governance comes good ministry. You see, good ministry rests on good government. Okay? Okay? We need good government, good spiritual government in our lives. In the throne room, there's also honor. There is lots of honor in the throne room. Look at the 24 elders. They didn't cast off restraint, did they? They cast their crowns. Plenty of honor towards the throne. There's such a thing as uh, this, well, we've heard this saying before that That honor is the currency of the kingdom. Have you heard that? Honor is the currency of heaven. That's good stuff. Currency allows us to make an exchange. Right? And so as we give honor, it puts currency in our pocket, if you will. As we receive honor, there's this exchange of the heavenly economy. And honor flows back and forth in that. Economics means the movement of scarce resources from one place to the other. That's why it says, that's why why there's that expression of honor is the currency of the kingdom. Because it's scarce. It shouldn't be. But when you come into the throne room, you realize if you're reflecting on what David set up in his tent or what we see in the revelation that John received of Jesus... That it's it's all about, it is 24-7 worship, praise. There's there's the bowl of of prayers, but there's honor flowing back and forth. So when we come into the throne room, we're reminded of the honor that's due. Romans says give honor to where honor is due. There's Proverbs about that as well. So as, as we pray and we come into a throne room experience, There's the economy of heaven that comes on us. And we're mindful of honor. Oh, honor moves things. Honor transacts things. Honor acquires and honor is generous and gives. So honor, should it is a core value of New Covenant Church. Imagine that. It is one of our core values is honor. Express it. Use it. However... The Lord told me to tell you that there is a, there is a dangerous side of, of, of honor and that currency that's exchanged. There can be a false honor that, that I received some, some teaching and revelation on this recently about how we understand that there are people that may have been due honor or because of their position we think they should receive honor. 
but they're not appropriating honor back. Or they are dishonoring. Or they are abusive. The Bible says honor your mother and father. So pastor, how, how can I not honor my father even though he's, he's abusive? Pastor, how, how can I not give, give honor to this, this person that's in this appointed or elected position? Here's the thing. Honor doesn't call you to exchange anything. Honor just calls you to acknowledge it. God puts people and governments in place. And we recognize his sovereignty. But it doesn't mean you have to give a withdrawal. doesn't mean you have to be subject to abuse. doesn't mean that you have to make an exchange. Does that make sense? I believe there's, there's, there's spiritual abuse. There's spiritual misappropriation of authority. There's 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 persons that were in positions of authority that if they are not being honorable and exchanging honor and true to their word, there's no obligation for you to falsely give honor because you only have so much. It's scarce. Pray about that. In the throne room, there's access as well. That's where I want to finish. I think you're pondering on the exchange. Let me help you. Sometimes, sometimes things are worth more in a certain season than in another. You see, there's like, like in New Zealand, there's an exchange rate of dollars. Like I thought it was going to cost so much to send my son to New Zealand until I saw the U.S. exchange rate. It's not as bad. Whew. There was a, a time when we didn't have two nickels to rub together, but I had a good bird dog. I had a good hunting dog, I thought, until I, I took her into the woods. She wasn't that good. We were newly married. The house we were renting was so hot, like it is in here. <laughs> and we needed an air conditioner desperately. We made an exchange. I found a good old boy that wanted a good old bird dog. And he had a window unit air conditioner. Let's make the trade. I equated that window unit with this. It was a... It was a Britney Spaniel with registered papers, AKC. I was like, wow, that was foolish. No, that was the value of that dog to me at the time. See, there's exchange rates vary in your life. People that, that are do great honor in your life at some time, some points, maybe don't need to be taking a withdrawal from you because you have this much. As circumstances and life changes, and there's somebody new that deserves the honor and glory. Maybe it's somebody different, or maybe somebody's coming. But be discerning as to what you dole out, depending on the season that you're in. I'm helping somebody here. Somebody's in this season. Somebody's getting it. I'm not trying to be mysterious. But Holy Spirit will reveal to you, oh, he's talking to me. I'm walking through that. I, don't, I need to get out from under that. I need to make an exchange today. Well, you can because you have access in the throne room. That's what you need to know lastly today, that there is full access to the throne room for you and I. You see, you may think it's so holy and amazing that you, I can't even go in there. Wow, all that I, I, that I read about there in Revelation 4, that's a place I can come into to be in the presence of God with just my little thing? Yes, yes, you can. 
Because Jesus opens the door. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. Do you think that door is closed? That door is open in your life. Why do you refuse to step in? He's waiting for you. All that glory that's in there, don't you be afraid. The glory is on Jesus, and you're his child. And the blood spilt for you was for you to enter in. The throne room is for us to access today. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Does anybody have a time of need? Does anybody need anything from the Lord? The only thing that, the, that can solve what you're dealing with is God. Does anybody have something like that? Well, the throne room is where you can find peace in His presence. Sometimes it's answers. Sometimes it's guidance. Sometimes it's comfort. It's revelation. Words of wisdom and knowledge. Healing happens in the throne room. We should be running after it, right? Sometimes we're running away, away from it because we don't understand it or we don't think we have access to it the throne room is for us especially now as we see it's a it's a global movement of of throne rooms coming to life in the local church and on the universities the revivals today are prayer and worship that start in humility and understanding that jesus has left the door open for us to come in and there's pockets of revival that come up and we've had revival here as well recently. It's been a little while now. But I think it's because of our humanity that it fades. We forget the divinity that Jesus has that he's bestowed upon us. That he's given us a robe of righteousness and it allows us to come on in. Come on in. Keep revival going in your heart. Keep revival going on the throne of your heart. And it'll keep spreading. And we'll be a part of this global movement. God is doing something. I don't want to be left out. God is doing something in prayer room here, in worship service here. It's not the same old church. It's not the same old, same old. And you're not the same. I asked the Lord, I said, how, how, can, I, how can I get it across to these people that, you, that I love how, how easy it is and how accessible the throne room is. He said, show them. He said, just show them, Pastor. That's what you do. I was like, Ugh, why do I have to always be transparent, Lord, when I ask you, what should I do? He said, show them. And so I, uh, I had some time in the throne room this week. And, uh, you know, depending on the season you're in, the exchange is different. The rate of ex exchange is different. When you're in chronic pain, the exchange is different. When you have a loved one that's dying, the exchange is different. When you have a broken relationship, the exchange is different. I don't know all the seasons that you're in. But the throne room is available for all of us. And that's where, like the living creatures, we'll be able to see things we didn't see before. We'll be able to hear things we haven't heard before. We'll be able to know things we didn't know before. Otherwise, you can stay outside and stay where you're at and hold on to that towel. It's not my heart for you. So, I'm just going to go to the throne room before you guys go to the throne room. Jesus, I thought when I walked in here, you might say, what are you doing here? But you left the door open. 
And you didn't say, what are you doing here? You said, come in, child. Come in, my son. And I said, are you sure? Is it, is it okay? Can I, can I be in your presence? All this honor going back and forth. All this worship. But that's where I want to be. I want to be in your presence. I want to be where there's honor. I want to be where there's worship 24-7. I want to be where all the things that, that drag me down, the things that I'm leaving behind by coming into the throne room, they, they don't distract me. All the times that, that I've been hurt, the dishonor, the disrespect, the whatever that's come against me, that's not right, that I just sit and take, I'm here. I just want to be in your presence, surrounded by honor and beauty and all the colors, and just tell you what I'm dealing with. And then, Lord, if you have something to share with me, I would gladly take it. But even if you don't have counsel or guidance or wisdom right now, I know you're working. I know you'll tell me when it's time. I know right now I just need to be in your presence. And sometimes, God, I'm asking for miracles, and I've seen you do them. And sometimes I'm asking for, for healing, and, and I have seen you heal me. If anybody's known me in the last few years, I have been healed. God, you've reconciled me in relationships that were broken. You've seen forgiveness exchanged. God, sometimes I'm coming in here crying out for this church, crying out for them to be healed, for them to get their healing, for them to see you, to come with a desire to be in the throne room, to be different, to have a heart for others that don't know you, to be ready for your return. God, I so want this church to be in revival, ready for your return, on fire for you, And yet I know some days I'm not. God, I'm just just here in your presence. So I'm going to join in and just worship. I'm going to worship. Here I am. So, church... You know, sometimes that's how it goes. There's not a person I'm looking at that can't do that. There's not a person in here that can't come into the presence of Jesus and be changed, be different when you come out of a throne room. Because when I'm when I'm there, I'm I'm simply like David in front of the Ark of the Covenant. That's why he wrote so many psalms in a place like that of humility and prayer and crying out to God and being honest with Him. David did that in the throne room and then wrote psalms for us to read. And I was censoring what I was saying because I was in front of you. But David... Maybe he was censoring, maybe the Holy Spirit was censoring some of the things that were canonized. But he was real. David was the forerunner. David had the blueprint. David had the prophetic vision for the throne room. And now, thanks to Jesus, we have access. And he calls you priests, he calls you kings, he calls you welcome. For ministry time today, I will ask our elders to come up at this time for for prayer. But I'm not asking them today to be available so much to pray for you. I'm asking them to continue that as if we're in the throne room. And they begin to praise. They begin to spiritually cast their crowns towards the throne. That they worship that they offer up their prayers, sacrifices of praise. And then, if you'll stand right now, I would love to activate the church. 
I would love to see you move as though you're in the throne room of God because you have every right and privilege to be, and He beckons for you to do so. And so as the worshipers, I wish we had 4,000. I wish we had 4,000. But I've heard the sound. I've heard the sound that sounds like 4,000. Have you been here on a Sunday when you're like, where'd everybody come from? It sounds like thousands are in here. Angelic myriads, the scripture says, myriads and myriads of angels singing and worship. So I, since I've, this space, this space, I don't want chairs because I want this to be a place of praise and prayer and worship. And so to activate you out of where you are and into a throne room, sometimes you have to physically move. You don't have to. But there's room, there's space. Come join the elders. Come, come move into the presence of Jesus where you can honor and worship and get answers and revelation or comfort and love. And he can call out the things that you are believing that are a lie. And he can call out truth and he can speak life over you. May we transition now as we close our service into the throne room. Not as you have usually expected ministry time. But you have as much access to Jesus as an elder. Believe it. Believe it, church. Believe it. Christ loves you that much. Christ calls you up. Christ calls you in. In Jesus' name.
I believe the healing river that began this morning in prayer room is continuing to flow. I believe in the throne room there is healing spiritually, there's mental, there's physical healing. If you feel sick in the heart, sick in the mind, sick in the body, I encourage you to press into prayer. Press into the healing flow that still continues this morning. There is an anointing in this place for that healing to continue. There's somebody with a with an ailment. Somebody with with a with pain. I don't care if it's in your heart in your body I will I will activate some elders at this point for healing prayer for anointing with oil I don't want to miss this window if that's you and I'm an elder so I'm participating would you come forward if that's you